just listen. Recording. <laughs> Valley's People, episode 12, <coughs> duration 1 by 30, record 8th of the 11th, 81, TBA, to be advised. Welcome again to the Valley's People. One of our guests today uh, can take the part of uh, Lady Macbeth in Macbeth, Portia in Julius Caesar, Lucy Sutcliffe in 96, and become uh, a New South Wales parliamentarian as well. And if you think that's something, you ought to hear the rest of the story. And uh, our second guest is, uh, is a man that uh, has been 50 years in office as a, a canon of the church, and the things that he's done in those 50 years take a lot of telling. I hope you can join us today when we meet two more interesting people from this valley. Thanks for joining us today. I guess from the introduction, uh, you've already spotted our first guest, Liz Kirkby. Welcome to the Valley's people, Liz. Thank you, Ron. It's great to have you. It's great to have you in Hunter Valley to start with, because uh, we've got some really colourful people here now, and uh, some of them we're, we're learning about in this series of programs. We're learning a lot about you, too, because, uh, well, so many of our viewers have seen you uh, as a TV <laughs> panellist and as a, an actor. And, uh, of course, now they're seeing you as a, as a parliamentarian. But mm -hmm. uh, firstly, back to uh, TV panel shows, because things like Beauty and the Beast and mm -hmm. Celebrity Squares and other things, they sort of brought you into contact with people's problems fairly early, didn't they? Some of them did. I think Beauty and the Beast did. I mean, that was a show that dealt with problems. Some of the others were just fun panel games. Yes, then there were the TV shows like uh, well, Homicide and Hunter and... Uh, Glenview High. Riptide, yes. Riptide, yes. <laughs> I often wonder whether any of the particular character parts that you play so well, whether they have or leave any impressions upon you at all. No, not, not very much. There was one particular part that I played for Crawford, though. I played the part of a very loving and doting mother whose teenage son becomes a drug addict. And in order to feed his habit, he falls into a life of crime and eventually um, by accident murders somebody. I mean, it is an accidental, but I mean, it is a murder. Yes. And um, that was a very unhappy part to play because obviously the mother and also the father reflected what must happen to many parents now. They don't believe that their children would be addicted to drugs. They don't understand mm. what they've done wrong yes. to make the child uh, take up a life like that. And particularly when it has such an a terrifyingly tragic result that yes. uh, you know there's a murder involved yes so you can't treat all these things in an off-handed approach you must oh no obviously inwardly I, digest mean, I mean things thing. like that are happening in our society now and there are people in society who are suffering because of that and I think it makes you aware particularly if it's a very well written script yes. of what their sufferings must be Yes, I often wondered when you see some of those shows, Liz, whether mm. in fact it's a feeling of, oh well, back to work, <laughs> or whether in fact you start to feel something as you're saying those lines. No, actually this was rather funny, well, not funny ha-ha, you know, mm. funny peculiar, because when we were taping it in Crawford studio, and at the end when the mother simply cannot understand what the police are trying to tell her, she bro breaks down. She dissolves into tears. Well, I mean, that is something actors have yes. to do from time to time. And it sort of wasn't a scene that was going terribly well, and there'd been one or two technical hitches. So, of course, it meant that I had to break down time after time. I couldn't just do it one shot off. And I don't know, I suppose I got all hyped up and also, of course, got into a high state of nerves. That I did break down quite you know, quite genuinely, not, I mean, far more than an actor normally would. And this had a most amazing effect on the crew and also on some of the other people in the studio. Yes. And the director then decided that he wanted it in close-up. 
You see, I mean, it had been a two shot like this, but he'd wanted to have a close up on my face, which meant that, of course, I had to go through all this again. Oh, really? And that was really quite scary because I don't think anybody, A, thought it would work, and it did work. And when we came off the set afterwards, oh, a couple of the cameramen who'd only known me, you see, because of Lucy and seen the sort of soap opera type thing that Lucy was and 96 was, said, gee, you know, where did you learn to do that? We so I said, look, chum, I've been around in this game a long time, you know, I mean... Yes, I, I guess a lot of it goes back to the early repertory theatre days in England and uh, in your parts there. Oh, yes, And wartime indeed. concerts too, I understand. Well, actually, I wasn't in concert party during the war. Uh, the Stars in Battle Race show that I did was, um, a, in fact, a play. I mean, I, eventually I did two or three plays, but the first one was a play about the war called Flare Path. Mm -hmm. And I played in that with uh, Griffiths Jones and Faith Brook, Clive Brooks' daughter, who is now a big star in the West End, with Kenneth Connor, whom everybody will remember from the Carry On yes. series, and also with Wilfred Hyde White. And of course, only a few years ago, when Wilfred came out to Australia to play in Jockey Club Stakes, we met again and uh, played in the same stage show together. Yes, great anecdotes swapped over a glass or two, <laughs> I should think. <laughs> yes. Listen, part that I can't quite fathom is how you ended up in, uh, in Malaysia, in uh, Kuala Lumpur, for those ten years on oh, radio. Well, um, I um, married uh, a man who was going to, out there to be a doctor uh, in the Malayan Medical Service, so, of course, like a dutiful wife, I packed my bags in England and left my career behind me and went off to live in Southeast Asia. And there was no professional theatre in Southeast Asia then, but there was radio. So I decided, OK, next best thing, mm -hmm. I'll join the radio station, and that's what I did. Yes, and that experience, no doubt, allowed you then to move straight into the ABC in Australia. Yes. Uh, in documentary form and uh, studying some of those things that you did uh, they, they were really uh, documentaries on social issues I think you had things titled the high cost of living uh, tax avoidance <laughs> <laughs> uh, high cost of hospitalization and illness yes, and so on right. and so on were yes. you gradually starting to uh, amass this interest in in civic affairs and people well I think the program did it for me this was a series that the ABC used to do on radio called fact and opinion and um, it was to raise various social issues and get expert opinion uh, about whatever issue it was. So um, I started working on these programs as a freelance and I went out in the way you do, collecting the material for the interviews and um, interviewing experts on the subject and then writing the li linking narration and then came back to the studio to put it all together. I guess that brings us from these uh, how many years living in a suitcase to settling on a property in Martinsville in the Hunter Valley. It's a pretty exciting moment for us. How did it happen to you? Well, when I went into 96, uh, I became very friendly with Sheila Kennelly. I mean, I'd known her before as a you know, fellow actor, but I'd not been a personal friend. And of course, she lives in the Lower Hunter. Yes. And she said, come on, come and stay for the weekend, which I did. And I mean, I'd been looking for somewhere in the country for some time. I mean, ever since I came to Australia in 1965, all over the place, Blue Mountains, Barrel area, uh, the Colo River, Mount Victoria, all over the place. And then when I came up here to stay with Sheila, she introduced me to her friend who was a land and stock and station agent. And um, he took us around to see various bits of land which he had on his books. And of course, like all these things in life, it's sort of fate then you find the one that you've been looking for and can afford. I mean, that came into it too. And did you start to get your interest in the Australian Democrats uh, at that point or were you always um, a little bit of a stirrer? <laughs> I don't, I think I've always been a bit of a stirrer and I was vice president of a union for oh, no, nearly equity, five wasn't years. Uh, Actors' equity, yes. yes. Um, but um, of course, Democrats weren't formed till 1977 and that was long after 96 ended and long after I'd come to live in Martinsville, so that uh, that was a later development. Yes, and you stood for Hunter, wasn't it, uh, earlier on? Yes. Uh, yes. In the 1977 election, I was pre-selected for Hunter. Um, that was the first general election in which the Democrats stood candidates. The seat of Hunter is the second safest seat in the federal parliament. There was absolutely no hope of winning it, 
but I did get over 13% of the vote, which was a pretty good effort. Yes, and no doubt uh, formed something in your mind, at least that degree of encouragement uh, to stand in, the, in a state well, election. Well, I mean, after all, even, even parliamentarians have to start somewhere, and that right. was my first campaign. That was the, my first experience of having to talk to public meetings about things like uh, political philosophies and m local issues. And then there was that point in your life where there were suddenly 96 ways to uh, vote Liz, <laughs> to, to make sure that Liz Kirkby got into state parliament. Well, that was um, a, a slogan that was dreamed up by one of the Democrat publicists at the beginning of this year when we were talking about what perhaps we should have on posters. And he said, would you mind if we use 96? And I said, no, of course not, because even if we don't use it, everybody else will because every time I talk to people, you see, they talk about 96 yes. the whole time. Yes. Could there, be, could there have been a backlash from people who uh, you know, didn't like the show? Wasn't a factor that you worried about? I don't know. There probably could have been. But you see, I think whatever some people thought about the show, uh, the character I portrayed was a very sympathetic, a very yes. honest character. Yeah, dear Lucy. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't a rapist or anything yes. like that, yeah. nor was I the nasty, evil lady like Maggie Cameron was. Or, Actually, uh, you were a very nice uh, housewife, really, uh, I you? was just a nice, uh, solid housewife trying to cope with lots of problems with children and grandchildren and an out-of-work husband and Well, in that show, there were enough problems around you to, oh, to run the three shows, weren't there? <laughs> and one other thing that uh, intrigues me, uh, Liz, uh, and I can't quite pin it down, how did you end up in Jamaica, of all places, studying women's problems? Well, it wasn't just that I ended up in Jamaica last December. What, in fact, uh, I, have, I am still a member of the International Association of Women in Radio and Television. Right. And this is an association I joined whilst I was still working for Radio Malaysia. And when I came to Australia, the Australian delegate was then, in fact, a woman who became my boss when I was hosting the women's program for the ABC, a woman called Ruth Sterling, who's since retired. So I kept my membership up. And uh, I went to a conference in Brussels in 1970 when I was elected to the council of the association. And then there were conferences in Stockholm and at the Helsinki conference I was elected as president. This was in 1976. And then we had our next conference in Munich in 1978. And it was then decided that the 1980 conference would be held in Jamaica. Now this was a very important step for this association because it had never before had a conference outside of Europe. And uh, so um, it was very interesting for all of us, all broadcasters, all women in radio and television, to have the opportunity to visit Jamaica as the guests of the Jamaican government. I guess this marriage of uh, culture is also uh, a good a facet of being a parliamentarian too. You see things in Oh, I think it's side. very important. Mm. I mean, we learned a great deal about Jamaica by being there in a conference for a week, mm. and then I spent a week there on holiday afterwards, and it's the most beautiful island. And of course, they'd only just had a change of government. In fact, some of the American delegates who were supposed to come to the conference, in fact, didn't attend because they were afraid the political atmosphere would be too unstable. There had been a riots and a lot of problems, mm. particularly in Kingston, which had um, resulted in the election of the new Premier, Mr Siaga, who of course was in Australia recently for the Chogham conference. Yes, well it doesn't seem to be uh, in keeping with your character to back off, so I can understand why you went Well, in fact, a lot of my European colleagues who are, are work in the field of current affairs were very angry because they said, really, these American broadcasters, do they call themselves broadcasters when they don't want to go to countries where there's been, you know, upheaval at the time of an election? because they really believed it was their duty to go and see what, what, what degree of upheaval yes. they'd been and, and how serious it was and what really made the country tick. Yes. Well, is there a lot of benefits, I guess, to people in the Hunter Valley for you deciding to uh, give away the suitcase and, uh, and have this magnificent and beautiful log cabin at Martinsville? Uh, and uh, we're very pleased that you could join us today in the Valley's People. Congratulations on uh, your recent appointment to, uh, to the Parliament of New South Wales, and we hope that continues for some while. Liz Kirkby, our first guest in the Valley's People, and I'll be back in just a moment with, uh, with a very interesting man. I'm sure you'll appreciate him.
Welcome back to the Valley's People. My next guest is uh, Canon Milton Williams. And Canon wears the robes of Canon Emeritus. In fact, he's the only person who can wear those robes in the Hunter Valley. Thanks for joining us today, Canon, because uh, as I read something about you, I, uh, I can say Canon Williams of Terrigal, but that's not right, is it? Because it's Canon Williams of Terrigal, Bullard Dealer, Raymond yeah. Terrace, East Maitland, Singleton, yeah. Wallenby. Yes, that's right. Yes, I've been in this diocese all my life. I was born at Wallenby on the 29th of uh, August, 1907. And 50 years ordained. And 50 years in the ministry, yes. yes. Uh, I, was, I celebrated 50 years as a deacon in February of this year, and I hope to celebrate uh, 50 years as a priest uh, in, on the 13th of December this year. That's fantastic. Yes. It's a long time. Yes. The thing that intrigues me about uh, you as, as, as a canon is the fact that you can be president of the Singleton Rotary Club and uh, church leader at the same time. Is there no conflict there? Uh, no, no conflict whatever. Well, any compromises then? Uh, no, I didn't compromise my principle in any way. I stuck to the uh, religious principles that uh, I've upheld all my life. And uh, I was invited to join Rotary because of my classification as a minister of religion. And uh, shortly after I got into Rotary, promotion came and uh, I became president of the Singleton Rotary Club, uh, during which time I uh, spread myself over the community because Rotary is a service club yes. and uh, serves the community. And I maintain I've been a Rotarian all my life because that's just what I've been doing, serving the community. And the ideals of Rotary. The ideals mm. of Rotary. And I thought there would be a greater scope if I joined Rotary to serve the community. And while I was president of Rotary, I inaugurated one or two schemes. Uh, I uh, tried to promote uh, occupational therapy at the hospital, which was... Uh, uh, a day hospital for um, uh, infirm and aged persons, especially those who had suffered from cerebral hemorrhage mm. and needed some uh, physical exercise. Well, I don't know that there's a degree of normality, is there, when you stand for local government, as you did in Singleton? Oh, yes. Shortly after I arrived, I was invited to nominate, um, and the person who invited me was a man who had been in local government at that time for 45 years, and that was uh, Ari Dawsman, who is now retired. And uh, I had no difficulty in getting someone to uh, uh, second the nomination, but when it, uh, I made it known to my own parishioners, many of them told me, quite frankly, they refused to vote for me not because they thought I hadn't the ability to be an alderman, but because they thought I had enough on my plate. And the uh, position as rector of Singleton and a member of Rotary was enough for me without further community uh, responsibility. But you felt you could use your, yeah. your influences there and get local yes, government. Yes, well I, well, I did. I said, while ever I'm uh, uh, a minister of religion, my influence concerns those few people who like going to church. Mm. And what I say in church uh, was never recorded anyhow. <laughs> but when I got out into the community and I said something startling, which I love to say at times, uh, because I've always been a bit of a stirrer, and uh, this was published in the local paper, and in fact it had been picked up by other papers throughout New South Wales. Yes, I was nosing about some uh, friends in Singleton, and I was talking about Canna Williams, and they said, oh, you mean Ban the Pan Williams? Oh, What's yes. What's this Ban the Pan business? Uh, well, now, I was terribly concerned that so many people in Singleton were not connected with the sewer, and uh, no effort had been made to encourage people to connect with the sewer, and I couldn't bear to see little old ladies walking a quarter of a mile up the backyard to go to the toilet in all kinds of weather. And so I decided that uh, I would start a campaign of ban the pan. And I'll probably be remembered throughout Singleton with that particular uh, thing that I did. Not probably, you are. <laughs> well, uh, this is right. Well, however, uh, the uh, campaign was successful. I had some opposition because the, uh, some of the aldermen felt we would be forcing old aged people who were living on a pension uh, to connect the sewer, which was a fairly expensive operation. 
I find some contrasts all over the place in your life. There's one that intrigues me, that you were on the, uh, the board of the Sinclair Hospital, weren't you? Oh, yeah. And then, how did, how did you get on? Because you would have to also visit the sick, wouldn't you? Uh, yes. Well, you're seeing uh, it from both sides. Well, I did. I saw it as a minister of religion when I visited my own people in the hospital. And when the opportunity came, uh, I was nominated and um, the Minister for Health at that time was Mr Sheehan and it wasn't long before the, uh, after the nomination that I received my appointment. And I enjoyed my work on the hospital because um, I didn't look upon the people who were in the hospital as patients. To me they were people, they were persons and they needed attention. How did you look on the people at the uh, Maitland Jail as you were chaplain of the Maitland Jail? Oh, as chaplain of the Maitland Jail, yes. Well, uh, they were still people, although they were, uh, had behaved in an antisocial manner and were really being punished for their antisocialism by being shut away from society. When, after they had served their sentence, um, the time would come for them to go out. Now, while I was chaplain of that jail, and I was for 17 years, I uh, was instrumental uh, with uh, Tony Enright, a solicitor of Maitland, in starting um, a prisoner's aid association, which was an organisation um, that would help the, in the rehabilitation of prisoners, would help them to get accommodation when they got out, because if they had no accommodation, nowhere mm. to live, it would be no time before they were back. And another thing was that they had to have a work. And this was a most difficult task. Uh, quite frequently, I made a journey from East Maitland to the BHP uh, with a prisoner in, uh, on the front seat of my car uh, to try and get him a job there. Mm. So I threw myself wholeheartedly into this job to try and rehabilitate these men whom I thought had a lot, still a lot of good in them. Mm. Some of them let me down, but there were still some who were really worth it. Mm. Some actually robbed your house out. Yes, they did. Yeah. They did. I, I, I helped a fellow and he came to me for breakfast one morning. They used to uh, let them out of the jail at uh, half past five on a winter's morning with no breakfast. And if they had no money and nowhere to go, what could they do? So they made a beeline for my place and uh, I used to give them breakfast. But one fellow sur uh, surveyed the setup of the place hmm. and uh, that night uh, robbed it. But we got him. Yes. You yes. were in Buller Dealer for a while. They tell me that was a bit of a stormy time. Oh, you? yes, I was in Buller Dealer uh, during the midst of the Depression. There were a lot of unemployed men in Buller Dealer at the time, but the government decided to develop the road from Buller Dealer uh, to Nabiak, which is now a special portion known as O'Sullivan's Gap. And they brought uh, hundreds of men from the coal fields and uh, they settled them in that particular area. The um, men objected to the conditions under which they worked and uh, it was a dry time, very dusty, the roads were dusty and they were working in dust. The water was short and they objected to the conditions. Well, this was fair enough. But they came in to me as I was president of a progress committee to preside at a public meeting so as the union representatives could put the case of the men and get the sympathy of the people of the town. Well, I had the feeling of the people of the town and they had no sympathy for them at all. If they were not prepared to work, they would. Yes. So uh, uh, I couldn't hold the meeting. And because I was not prepared to preside at this public meeting, I used to get catcalls when I passed by when the men were working. I couldn't stand it any longer after a few trips passed. And one day I pulled up the car threw off the clerical collar and the coat and went up to a fellow who is much smaller than I and said, what did you say? He said, I was just bidding you the time of the day. Well, I said, when you speak to me, you speak to me in a proper manner. I don't want any more respect than the average citizen of Australia. Well, it soon got around that I was able to use my fist, which I can't, <laughs> and uh, the... Uh, uh, men then, as I passed by, used to raise their hats. It's as well he didn't know you could. He, he, it was well, but he was much smaller than <laughs> I, and I could have taken him home. Anyhow, I became great friends with um, 
the foreman of the time, who afterwards became the commissioner of Main Roads and has since died, poor fellow. But I uh, married several of those men to local girls and uh, altogether uh, um, things improved. Yeah, well you married a singleton girl anyway. So yes, you, well you... I did. I married a singleton girl and I've never regretted that. She's been a great help. She must be doing uh, something right because I don't think anyone's going to believe you're 75. No, uh, <laughs> no she uh, looks after me too well really. <laughs> I, but uh, she's been absolutely marvellous and everything that I've undertaken she's been behind me a hundred percent. Mind you it's probably fairly facetious I guess to say yeah. this to a canon but I understand you had a, a coronary and I guess that you were sort of halfway to your maker because you had yeah. it in church. Yes I did. I, I had if a You're going to have one that's the place I guess. Well this is what I, I said to myself I knew I was having a coronary and uh, I said to myself well if I'm going to receive my call home there's no better place. And one Were you of the, preaching at the time? Uh, no, I just finished my sermon, probably got a bit stirred up and yeah. excited and that's what brought on the, uh, on the coronary. But I settled down, sat down and, uh, um, for a while and there was an aged man there who helped me with the service and uh, I so covered it up. A hymn was sung and while I was sitting down, no one took any notice of it and in five or ten minutes it passed off. Yeah, well, if okay. I could say so, one of the great problems, I think, with Canon Williams is you've covered up quite successfully a magnificent story of your life, and I think someone should maybe put it to book form because it involves far more than we could ever talk about today in the Valley's people. Canon yeah. Williams, thank you very much. We honour you for your robe, your position in the church that, uh, you know, most will envy. And uh, your life in the Hunter Valley and now in Terrigal and the Central Coast has been something of inspiration to others. Yeah. Congratulations, thank and thanks for joining us today thank you. It's been on a great the Valley's pleasure. people. Great pleasure. I'll be back in just a moment. Well, our guest today in the Valley's People, uh, Liz Kirkby, who now has a voice in Parliament, and Canna Williams, who has very much a voice over the pulpit and has uh, preached some fairly exciting sermons on strikes in the Hunter Valley. Hope you'll join us again uh, in our next program when we meet more of the Valley's People. Goodbye for now. <laughs>